Okay. Um, welcome everybody to um, another virtual schools forum. Um, I think we hope that uh, if we had this as a virtual meeting, we might uh, move forward into um, uh, future meetings with actual attendance, but the way that uh, numbers of COVID are going, it's anybody's guess. But uh, our next meeting isn't until middle of November, so there's uh, a fair time for things to uh, to change. Mm -hmm. I just technically, uh, Chair, I think when we discussed this at the last meeting of Privates one, I, I think it was agreed um, simply for convenience of um, school members from some far-flung locations, representative as we are across Northumberland, that meetings would be virtual unless we took the decision to call a face-to-face -face meeting for a specific reason. Um, so, you know, again, that's the position we're in currently. Right, I'd forgotten that. Um, I thought maybe we were moving towards hybrid meetings, but uh, I don't think they're a terribly good idea. Uh, to be perfectly honest, um, I've found the many, many uh, virtual meetings that I've done over the last 80 months, I've found them, found them very good, and I would be very happy to continue. So thanks for clarifying that, please. We'll keep this under review anyway. Moving to the agenda anyway. Um, item one, membership and membership update. Bruce? Yes, um, I would obviously again, it's just like to take the opportunity to welcome uh, Nicola Nicola Brannan to her first schools forum member. Nicola confirmed she'd like to join forum to, and we conveyed that to the July meeting. But this is the first meeting that Nicola has been able to attend. So welcome Nicola. Um, you can't acknowledge that. Uh, we still are a place or two light in terms of schools forum and now schools are back. We will circulate that again through schools membership um, and see if there are any further takers. Um, you know, I think we've always worked on the principle one willing volunteer is better than 10 pressed participants <coughs> and we'll Absolutely. continue like that. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, can we move on then? Apologies. We don't seem to have any Heather. Is that right? Can I suggest? Sorry, no, I haven't received any. Right, we'll check those through Andrea subsequently and, uh, and ensure any apologies are reflected in the minutes subsequently. That's fine. That's my few. Um, item three, disclosure of interest, if any. No. No. Okay, thank you. Um, moving into uh, item four, the minutes and matters arising. Uh, oh, and this just gives me the opportunity to say that uh, um, I don't know how the rest of you feel, but I thought getting all of the papers in one file was very, very useful. Um, it saves uh, it saves one having to dot all over the home screen trying to find different uh, different uh, papers at different times. So I appreciate that, that initiative. Thank you very much. I'll pass that column on Andrea. That was very much um, her initiative. That's her it. initiative, smashing. Well done. OK, um, we're taking matters of accuracy and matters uh, arising together. So uh, first page of the. Um, uh, of the minutes. I'll share those on screen as we work through them, Chair, if that would be helpful. Okay, that would be helpful. First page is attendance moving into page two um i have got something at 90.6 um we haven't had um anyone coming forward to volunteer as vice chair um nor as chair of the formula funding committee um i've got two people in my sites and i will contact them after this meeting so you, you can all sweat hard on that one. Um, anything else on page two? Moving into page three then. Yes, Chair. 92.5 has uh, Councillor Rimmer Renner Thompson and provided the forum yet with the, uh, the, uh, the outcome of Bright Tribe. Fortunately, Councillor Renner Thompson isn't as I understand it, at the meeting, um, I, I'm not aware of any specific update in relation to that, Graham. Yeah. Audrey? 
I, I can provide that for you. So um, I have spoken to regional schools commissioner um, and and provided Guy with the update. He's not at the meeting, so I'll just tell you. Uh, but at this moment in time, regional schools commissioner have not got any plans to recover or have no system in which they can recover that money. It remains DFE stroke bright type discussion and we have to stay outside of it. What I have done is made sure that this forum's view of that has been shared with the Regional Schools Commissioner and DfE. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Graham, I think this is going to limp on for a long time. Um, would you pref would you like to keep it in the minutes? Or well, I can say, uh, Chair, I say very clearly. Obviously, uh, you know, money has been put into Aden Bridge School by the local authority. But this is public money, so I think somewhere it should be kept there in view because if we just let it go. Somebody may ask in years to come, why didn't we do something about it? Yeah. OK, well, it's certainly of interest, so we will leave it there. 92.2, um, um, the capital investment plan is on the agenda. Um, school organisation plan. This, uh, I assume Sue's here, I can't see her on the screen, uh, but that will, that hasn't been, uh, the new version hasn't been approved by Cabinet yet, so that will come to a later meeting. That's correct. Okay, moving on then, the rest of page three, anyone? Chair, yeah. j chair yeah. just, to, just to note that... Um, Number of occasions where um, I, I switch between being Mrs. Kingham and Mrs. Kinghorn, so it would be help, <laughs> helpful to just have me as Mrs. Kingham. Um, and at the membership, uh, I'm no longer the interim director, so just for, just for accuracy for the record. Oh, I am so sorry about that. Oh, um, we should have, you, you know, you've just reminded me that at an earlier meeting, we should have offered our congratulations to you on on that appointment. Heather will clarify that. Yeah, just oh, to yes. ensure accuracy. Thank you. OK. Um, rest of page three um, and into page four. Um, that was, yeah, before, the full point already, was the point you raised, Colin, about the ongoing nature of the meetings. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, 94.9. Bruce, you are going to publish um, information about yes. voting rights, but I think you're going to publish other things as well. Um, Indeed. The suggestion was we checked last time and we felt it was important in terms of transparency that schools forum membership was evident on the schools forum website. So we're going to publish, um, you know, with the agreement of forum, both the membership, which was agreed last time, but it would be, I suggest that if we publish the schools forum powers, it might be helpful for the general, for general uh, consumption and the general public at that point as well. So we'll, uh, yeah, we'll pick so that's that up. Intact. Yeah, thank you. Rest of page four. Um, page five, 95.6. Um, I, I, David, I was at um, David Street. I was just a bit confused by this. Um, and I was talking to Bruce about it, and um, Bruce was suggesting that was the forum might be con, uh, consulted about um, how to use the, uh, the, the DAF. It uh, doesn't have the authority to make decisions. Bruce, can you just pick that up and say a bit more? Yes, yes, just halfway through 95.6. And I know very much in terms of the, the spirit in which the minute was intended, and I should have corrected this earlier. Um, the minute records that um, David suggested the forum may wish to consider using the surplus staff to support the early years inclusion fund. Uh, technically, of course, while um, we're welcome and open to forum scrutiny around that, that would be an authority decision. Um, and essentially, you know, again, I think the key thing is that following, obviously, the highlight that we highlighted this issue last time and and uh, Mrs Dickinson's really helpful note and circulation through the EY bulletin about the use of the DAF. The prime focus would be to try to address the underspend in the DAF 
And if that continues to be an issue, we'll then look at how that should be reallocated, you know, okay. i.e. the authority. But yeah. The forum would be uh, kept informed and consulted about that. Any, In, anything you want to add to that, David? No, just, just that it is an ongoing work stream to try and get the DAF allocated to, to those learners who need it uh, okay. and are entitled to it. Um, it, 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 none of it goes to waste, um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. but at the same time it is for individual learners and therefore it should be with those individual learners rather than used as a backup to support the whole it, it, from a SEND perspective. Okay. okay. Uh, 95.9. Um, is Mike with us? I can't see him, Mike Dean Hall. Anyway, um, David, um, you are going to take forward some action on the point that Mike raised um, about his nursery. Uh, yeah, yes, um, as you'll recall, um, there were a number of grants, um, central government grants made available to the early years sector to support them through COVID and loss of income. Um, but there were a number of early years providers who uh, didn't qualify. So um, there were obviously some 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 key elements for the grants that were available. Um, one of them, you know, uh, um, you needed to be able to demonstrate your business rates, but yet someone that hired the community hall wouldn't have a set of business rates in order to apply, even though they're running exactly the same business and having exactly yeah. the same sorts of issues. So there were, were a number of providers who had not been able to access any of the um, um uh, uh, grants that were available the business grants that were available so what we did following the meeting was the finance end of the early years team um developed an internal grant for northumberland um, and went to all providers and it, it was applicable to anyone who hadn't got a grant through the business grant scheme um and could demonstrate that they'd had a, a loss of income throughout the covid period um, we have had uh, a number of applications for those grants and have paid them um, and we'll uh, review the, the pot of money that was made available from the early years block in order to attempt that um, to see whether we can go out again and actually repeat the process. Um, so if there is any, uh, any funds left available, we are going to attempt to get it out to those settings that haven't benefited from the previous grants. Um, very and good. that's where we are. Um, if Mike's around, you might want to comment on that or not, I'm not sure. Apologies, we have had uh, apo apologies. Mike Dean all has sent apologies through for today's meeting. Um, I, I, they are with Andrea, but I think it clashed with a, um, a, a commitment at school. OK, um, David Naudry, um, from where I'm sitting, I think that's, uh, that's admirable. Um, I assume that, that funding has come from um, sort of general um, county coffers. Is that right? It, it's it's been funded from the early years block. From the early years block, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the the there was obviously some of the question marks. Um, it, it, we we had to be obviously cautious. There, there was a small surplus um, yeah. at the end of last year in the early years block. Um, but actually, we don't get a final confirmation and COVID has got in the way as well. We don't get a final confirmation on the last year's funding until Abby might have to dive in. Somebody. I think I think we're sort of waiting until December time until we actually yeah. know what the end balance from last year was. OK, yeah. so we've taken a little bit of a, a calculated risk, uh, put aside some of that for, for grants. Um, but um, we. Uh, we may have be in a clawback position as well, and so we've we've kept some funds aside in, in case there's a clawback position. It does seem bizarre that the financial year ends, and then then we are looking to seven and eight months down the line until we actually know what the outturn figure is yeah, because yeah. of the way central government have operated the funding through through COVID. Okay, thank you for that. Um, anything else on page six? Page seven. Page eight, page nine, much of this covered on the agenda. Okay, 
Any further comments on um, the minutes of the last meeting? Well, Chair, true record with the amendments. Thank you. Okay, moving on um, to item five, uh, communication. Only one item, Chair, which is the draft minutes of the Formula Funding Committee, which was held two weeks ago today. Um, they've been included in the uh, in the agenda pack. Much of the items we're picking up are on the agenda today and are reflected in the you know the national funding formula update yeah um, would be the intention we do have another meeting of the funding formula committee um scheduled for the 3rd of november again that's timed two weeks before the next schools forum meeting when we come with the formal consultation on school funding for 22-23 OK, um, but the outcome of that, that formula funding uh, meeting is uh, covered a, uh, a little later on the agenda anyway. Yes, yes. OK, can we move on then to item six, um, capital update, Sue? I'm not sure Sue's with us yet. OK. Um, in Shall Sue's absence, and nobody certainly could deliver the capital paper like Sue can, can I suggest that we take the subsequent um, agenda, the, the next agenda item on the fair funding for all consultation, uh, starting in page 31 in the agenda pack. Okay. And then we'll come back to the capital presentation, Chair. That's fine. And in fact, that uh, follows on very well from the, uh, uh, the formula funding uh, minutes. Anybody think okay. it was a plan? Thank you. So item item seven, let me just bring my. OK, Bruce, can you take us forward on that? Certainly, um, I think the the papers and the current consultation on fair funding for all have been sort of circulated certainly a couple of times through um, both this um, before shortly before the summer break when the papers were first circulated and with the agenda papers. Um, it was obviously the subject of some discussion at the funding formula committee and we subsequent and I subsequently took some notes from that meeting and circulated a draft response. Um, what we received as of yesterday, members will be aware that we're um, subscribing members to the formula 40 group uh, in terms of the LA group looking at school um, school funding and school uh, funding allocations and we've received it. A, dra a draft response from Formula Fundy, which they intend sending by the deadline tomorrow. Um, what I would propose is just to take you through that response, which Formula 40 has provided, just to refresh you of the key themes, pick up any points they have made and see if anybody wants to make any additional comments or suggestions prior to our submission of the final, um, our final response by the deadline tomorrow. I'd remind members that obviously they're also free in their own individual right or on behalf of individual schools and individual governing bodies to submit a response to the fair funding consultation um, should they feel um, yeah, feel a, a desire to do so. We, we look at the funding formula response. Uh, yeah, just bear with me, I'll share this a slideshow. Okay. Again, back on papers, we've seen that. Um, again, this is the DFE's key principles behind it of fairness, simplicity and transparency. And actually that could be efficiency and predictability as well, but never mind. English, it's it's numbers, not English. OK. So again, first proposal subject to the development of premises and growth funding factors proposed to include all national funding formula factors in the hard formula or direct formula as it's being called now without further local adjustment through local formulae. Um, again, first question, do you agree with this with this objective? No. And then again, we, there are more extensive comments from the F, F40 group in the final uh, sweep up statement. Um, a key concern around that would be around premises funding and how they can pick that up. Premises funding is currently allocated on a historic basis so school bills are essentially 
Um, while we, we refund schools on the, on the basis of their actual bills, we're refunded on a lag basis a year in arrears from the DfE in respect of that. Um, funding for split sites is certainly an issue for us and again it would be interesting to see how the DfE would propose to pick that up specifically. If people are ready, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll move on beyond that. And in, you know, one suggestion there in terms of uh, a case could be made that a school on two sites should not receive re refunding beyond what would be provided if it were two separate schools with two lump sums. That's certainly not an issue for Northumberland because the split site figure, uh, split set, site of allowance of £67,000, it's approximately that, is, you know, is less than half, sorry, is uh, less, significantly less than the lump sum figure of 117,000 or 121,000 proposed for 21 for 22-23 um, and that it, that would be anomalous and I'd, I'd, yeah, if any local authority chose to do that I I would have some support of Formula 40's comments there again moving on um, proposal um, is around using national standardised criteria to allocate all aspects of growth and falling rules funding on a lag basis, including funding for growth to meet basic needs for new schools. Do you agree with the proposal to use national standardised criteria to allocate all aspects of growth and falling rules funding? Um, no is the short response and there's no opportunity to comment. One of the aspects which again is picked up here and I think what they're saying is actually we don't have a standardised system at the moment. And that was evident in the consultation paper, where essentially, uh, specifically, and again, popular growth funding, we pick this up on the next slide, so I'll not anticipate that. Okay, I'll move on. Um, again, popular growth funding, uh, the, the point is made that the popular growth funding system is inequitable. Now, what it means by that was what was evident in the consultation paper is that um, there, there are opportunities for additional funding through popular growth, through multi-academy trusts currently, which aren't open to local authorities and maintain schools. Um, so there is obviously a view that the current system isn't a standardised one and there isn't a national funding formula in place in respect of that. And again, I think that equity and transparency are what the national funding formula is supposed to be working towards. Um, and it's a and it's an observation I made in the, you know, the draft comments I circulated uh, with the papers for the meeting. Um, apologies, I can't see if there are any comments coming through the group because I'm going through the presentation. Um, but please let me know otherwise. Yes, check and Rob, there is um, a comment from Debbie Wiley saying that growth fund isn't available to single academy trusts. Again, there's a, I would suggest there's an inequity in the system as well in that case, Debbie, yeah. Quick interruption, my apologies, my computer crashed completely um so it's taken me about five minutes to get back in so but i'm back with you thanks bruce if you can yeah, no problem just continuing through the um the next question is really about how the esfa can encourage local authorities to align and move closer to national funding formula um again I think looking specifically at the questions on the following slide, do you agree that in 23-24, which is obviously the year following the um, following the next financial year, each local authority should be required to use each of the NFF factors? Um, yeah. And I think, again, when we met as a funding formula committee, the feeling, I think, was very much, let's simply get on with it. Um, Question six, do you agree that all local authority formula, except those who are already mirroring NFF, should be required to move closer to NFF, smoother transition? 
And then question 7A suggests that there is an arbitrary sort of 10% um, requirement that authorities move a minimum of 10% closer. Um, as I've sort of conjectured from that, the bit that worried me in relation to that would be that we could be 10 years off moving to the national funding formula on that basis. Um, and, you know, we're already very closely aligned. It, it feels like uh, unnecessary extension of the time scale. Uh, again, moving on. 7B. Do you have any comments about appropriate threshold levels? Um, I will circulate this this uh, presentation following these uh, following the forum this morning. I think our observations around question eight was it wasn't so much around an arbitrary ten percent threshold because in some cases that wouldn't be material. Um, we don't use mobility currently. If we were acquired from 23-24 or we chose from 22 to 23 to incorporate mobility and move 10% of that 10% of the way there, I think the that would distribute distribute a total of approximately five thousand pounds through all of the you know 150 odd schools we have in Northumberland. Um, so again, rather than an arbitrary percentage, I think some sort of materiality threshold would make sense. Okay, moving on. Um, additional flexibility and the English is additional language factor that depends very much on the measure and the data collection used. It again makes sense. It's a relatively small issue for us. Additional flexibilities remain in place for uh, for Sparsi for 23-24. Forum will recall that um, you know sparsity is something we have championed. As an authority, um, we we moved to full national funding formula factor on using sparsity in the previous financial year um, to ensure that you know schools who benefited from the sparsity formula benefit to the full extent of the national funding formula. We felt that was important when we're making the point that we should be distributing additional sparsity funding to to, um, to support small rural schools anyway. Um, but I appreciate some of authorities may not be all the way there yet. So again, I can understand that response. Again, specifically um, opportunity to review the central school services block. The proposal was essentially that the, um, you know, again, first of all, in terms of the background, it pays for some of those core central services school services such as the management of admissions, place planning and the such like. Um, I think the suggestion that it could be wholly done on a traded basis is not appropriate for those statutory functions primarily. And I think that's the question that's raised through Formula 40 as well. I think when I commented in relation to this, Mike, and I'm actually going to highlight a point at the bottom there. Sorry, I'm going to go back. The recent pandemic has provided a good example of the value that local authorities play in this role of providing education leadership, engaging extensively with all schools, that both maintain schools and academies. Um, and again, it's about ensuring funding for these activities are maintained. And I think obviously COVID provided examples of that. Um, that you know there is there remains a role. I believe there's still very much a role for uh, local authorities within education. Moving on. Again, I think one of the concerns for me would be that if we saw a further diminution or a removal of the central school services block. And the proposal is essentially that it could be just transferred directly to part of the overall local government financial settlement, that it could be lost within that. Um, and I, I've commented accordingly in our proposed response. Um, 12 again, um, do you agree for the proposal for a legacy grant to replace funding for unavoidable termination of employment and prudential borrowing costs? That relates to the historic element of the current CSSB. You'll remember that's something again we successfully negotiated with the um, 
the ESFA last year because they reduced that funding to a level that was less than our historic commitments. And we would hope that there would remain some flexibility in the system to do that. Whether it was through a legacy grant or yeah, preferable to us an ongoing CSSB. Uh, this was an interesting one and I hadn't seen this coming just about the funding year. Um, you know, it, obviously we will be aware that you are aware that the um, academies are funded on a September to August um, academic year and a financial year, whereas maintained schools work on the standard local authority financial year of April to March. Um, there was a suggestion that we should investigate moving maintained schools to being funded on a academic year basis, um, consultation uh, response from F40 disagreed. Um, and then subsequently, question 14 asked about any advantages or drawbacks. Um, obviously, it would extend the lag um, we've talked about in terms of between the actual date that's used to set funding and then the, the point at which it's used to uh, payments are made. Uh, currently, you know, the October school census is the key focus uh, which drives the data behind the funding settlement um, for local authority maintained schools. It would then essentially be effective from April and for academies from September, but it would push things back that again further in terms of September for uh, all schools. Should we do that? I could certainly see problems from the point of view of consolidation of accounts. But I've, there will be corporate finance colleagues in the meeting who are in a far better place to comment than me in relation to that. And that's some of the key issues that are highlighted in the, uh, you know, in this response from Formula um, from F40. Um, potential equality. Sorry, Colin. Yeah. I think all of this, um, our debate in the formula funding um, committee and the response of uh, F40 shows that this is uh, not so straightforward as uh, as one might might think. Um, there are still many issues to be uh, to be ironed out. Um, it did and seem to be out of left field. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had an interesting meeting, didn't we? Mm. Um, and it's interesting that uh, uh, government is not putting forward a firm date. It's choosing not to put forward a form a, a firm date for uh, the introduction of the national funding formula. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, sorry, Bruce. Whilst I've got the floor, um, I lost about five minutes of that when my computer crashed. Um, have you seen Debbie Wiley's? Um, yes. Uh, comment. And have you have you responded to that? It, it was, you know, I, I can't see it on screen, but um, Heather, uh, Heather highlighted that, and I think it just demonstrates the okay. potential inequity, well, the, the current inequity in the system, which we would like to see addressed. Okay, okay. Um, again, just finally finishing this uh, off, um, comments in relation to, uh, you know, equality's impact. Again, nothing specific in relation to that. Um, 16 further comments. Um, again, the point is made in the consultation paper and the response about, you know, permitting multi academy trusts to pool funding. Um, you know, what that means in practice is that the, the trust will receive the funding on behalf of all its membership schools. Um, and I had a really interesting discussion with a sort of lead trust finance officer outside of the county. And I think the, you know, the interesting point she made is that, be, you know, due to transparency and all the other, yeah, you know, um, that funding is all, is in, um, generally speaking, passport, it's straight, straight through to schools anyway. It would be any school that wasn't receiving its, um, you know, sort of, formula funding through would be raising an issue, you know, with their trust in respect of that after, you know, appropriate deductions have made for central services and things. And that's very much an ex a very rare exception rather than the rule for a multi-academy trust. Um, 
but technically that um, provision, you know, it remains possible. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm flying on because again, we, that's the uh, penultimate slide. Well, uh, point out minimum per pupil funding levels. Okay. That's essentially where we are. I'm going to end that slideshow. I will circulate that following the meeting. Um, I don't know if there are any points or suggestions that um, people wish to make prior to um, picking up the consultation response. Uh, I can see Sue's joined the meeting now. Sorry, I just picked that because having come off the presentation mode. If we look briefly at the proposed response from Northumberland and pick that up as part of the agenda papers, um, we'll then look at the capital update item. Um, Here we go. The point is made about exceptional premises. Costs can't be determined by a national formula and they may need to rely on historic data. Um, we've touched on this point about popular growth and uh, growth funding. Um, you know, and again, we make that point there and it was uh, Debbie's observation was helpful and informative around that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we made the point there about the, you know, the question about the moving 10%, you know, that again, just had concerns, I think, not just for me, but for funding formula committee as well, but, you know, unnecessarily prolonging the process. We made the point about thresholds and materiality. Um, Additional, flexi additional flexibilities in place. Um, and then a, the other question was really about the, the response to the proposal to move the financial year. If anybody has any specific additional points to make, um, I would need them. I would need them by the close of play today, but otherwise we will make uh, representations along those lines. Or as you said uh, earlier, um, Bruce, people can make their own representations direct. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay, are there any other comments or uh, comments to be made under that item, item seven? Yes, Bruce, there's a comment from Debbie. Um, once the transition is implemented, the September date is a really straightforward way of getting budget to align with expenditure. For example, our pay in increments for all staff take place in September. Yeah. I appreciate every school would come from different perspectives. No, no, it's a good point, and I can see how it would work from a point of view of an individual school. I would just have concerns about how it would then be for the consolidation of local authority accounts, how that would work. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I can see from a perspective of an individual school how that um, how that might work. You're working on sort of you know one terms intake on it and a on it. I I worked in a sort of um, you know non-maintained school some time ago and I, I had very problematic discussions with a head teacher about the number of pupils he was budgeting on and because we were budgeting across two academic years it invariably involved a fraction when we averaged it out and anything we can do to move away from that I can see. How, it could be potentially beneficial. So, Graham's got his hand up there. Graham? Yeah, thanks, Bruce. It's a similar point, and it's not to change the response in the paper, but just given that we've got academies represented within Northumberland, it was just to make the point that the that we find as an academy um, operating the financial year aligned with the academic year is overall beneficial. You made the point that payroll is a large item in it is obliged to sit with the traditional uh, financial year, but actually on other aspects of our accounting, aligning the academic and financial years is, is better. And it's a bit of a, a, a nuisance, if you like, trying to um, kind of uh, align with um, the NCC's approach because it obviously operates the financial year. So I would just make the point that academies, I think, support the alignment of academic and financial for what that's worth. And the other point, just from a, an academy's perspective, 
Um, the, the flexibility that pooling gives Max is is helpful to have. So again, that you know, it's not particularly relevant necessarily to ma maintain schools or indeed this response, but it is something from an academy's perspective that we we'd value. Okay, that's a um, fair point well made, Graham. Much appreciated. I think interestingly, just while you know, just a point in relation to. I'm conscious of the approach taken by the council now when we tend we 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 have this um, perennial split now between the five twelfths and seven twelfths to try to manage uh, sort of services charges and a, a grant apportionment on behalf of both um, maintained schools and councils uh, and maintained schools and academies. Um, you know, the SLA charging is one example of that, and hopefully that does help to an extent. But yeah, yeah, that's a good point made. Thank you. OK, anything else under agenda item seven? Sorry, Colin, I'm pinching your thunder. No, you're fine. Yeah, uh, um, I'm just <laughs> I'm looking at the bottom of page 41 um, uh, of the government paper. Um, I'll just quote, whilst the hard national funding formula is our clear long term goal for delivering a fair funding system, we recognise that it also has a significant change. It is also a significant change, one that requires careful implementation and transition to avoid unexpected disruption. Well, they've had four years to sort that, but never mind. This is particularly important as the school system focuses on supporting recovery from the impact of the pandemic. Um, looks as if they're using the pandemic as a as a reason to sort of. Uh, not progress any uh, any more quickly. Uh, that's just a just a comment. Uh, but then you you have the, the killer line. Consequently, we do not propose at this point to set a fixed target date by which the hard national funding formula will be fully fully in place. So you know the debate is is valid. It's relevant. All the points are interesting. But you know um, what the impact will be. You know we can only wait and see. Um, but thank you, Bruce, for taking us uh, taking us through that. Uh, any final points before we move on? Uh, is a comment from Alan Hardy. I don't know if you can see it or if you want me to read it out. Sorry. September start to school financial year works well for Academy, so I agree with Debbie's point. It'd be helpful if other systems become fully aligned with this. It'll be interesting to see what the groundswell of opinion is, um, uh, you know, across the full consultation. Um, especially as the, uh, um, uh, the, the weight or uh, the balance, anyway, of um, maintained schools to academies um, changes. This may be something that's, uh, that changes over time. We'll have to wait and see. Okay. Thanks for that, Alan. Okay. Thank you. Um, can we move back now to item six then? Sue, um, Sue, you're in your car. I am Colin. Apologies. Yes, I was always going to be in the car, but I just expected to be back to back in it sooner than uh, than I actually managed. I had uh, an unexpected visitor on a site visit that I had to uh, have a conversation <laughs> with. So apologies. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, okay. Please, uh, please go ahead. OK, so I just wanted to highlight um, some of the facts within the uh, within the report. Originally, this report was written for our uh, Family and Children's Services Scrutiny Committee just to um, update them on the, the level of investment um, across the, the, the school estate, that is both academies and, um, and maintained um, schools, which again is something that's probably quite unusual in local authorities. There's not as many, not many local authorities like Northumberland that invest um, in its uh, academy um, estate. Um, I'll just highlight some some uh, points in the report and then Bruce is going to put a presentation just up on the screen just so that you can physically see some of the things that have been uh, going on because I think the picture speaks a thousand words doesn't it and the uh, just talking about things is uh, a lot less entertaining than seeing physically what we've uh, what we've been able to achieve. So yeah, just picking up some of the key issues within the report then, um, just to say that it, it, it continues to be a challenge, uh, both for individual schools and the local authority in, in maintaining uh, the, the, the school estate. 
um, and we've currently got in excess of £57 million worth of backlog maintenance costs. That's just within our maintained um, sector as well. So that doesn't include ID church schools or academies. So when you add that, um, that on, it will probably well in excess of £80 million worth of, of backlog maintenance that we would have. So that's one of the, uh, the, the real challenges for us in terms of... Um, continuing to keep our schools open, keep them safe and keep them watertight. Um, and again, there's a variety in, of, of ways in which the council address the ongoing issues. Um, and again, that's detailed in section two of the report under school capital investment program, where you'll see uh, identified a number of smaller projects and, and how we get central government funding uh, to address that. We also have um, growing capacity is also one of our, our key issues, again, in our school estate to meet the demand that we have for places. Um, and again, we've, we've, we've done some more projects um, based on that just this, just this summer um, at, at Chantry and at, at Newminster in Morpeth. Um, and as the, the report points out, um, we do have a number of surplus places in Northumberland, uh, nearly 9,000 surplus places as of October 2020. Um, but again, these surplus places rarely are where we need the demand, um, so we are still faced with challenges in actually uh, growing the, the capacity in the right areas for the right time. And again, we get central government um, funding for that in terms of basic need funding. And that is used again, both in maintained schools um, and academies and our special school estate as well, um, wherever we need to grow capacity um, across the, the school estate. Sue, can I just ask yeah. a question about that? What's the yeah. direction of travel in surplus places? Um, upwards, Colin. We're just about to um, produce another school organisation plan, and I think you'll probably find that will come out into the into the public domain tomorrow, ready okay. to be heard at fax on the seventh of October. But um, sitting here today, based on you know. Um, January census, we've got less children in school currently than we have in the previous five years. Um, so you can see decline across the piece and particularly in our far north and far west of our counties. So our rural com communities, you know, obviously are not getting as many young children um, being born in their areas. But all of that detail is in a really comprehensive document. Um, that again we'll, we'll circulate once it's been through the, the committee approval process again we can circulate that to, to forum members as a as a point of interest um, okay. because it is it is very much about how we plan um, and how we spend money around growing capacity it also talks about section 106 funding and where developer contributions are used to grow capacity in the areas of growth as well um, but it does give you the whole context but in each partnership so probably yeah, a helpful reference document to look at okay and sue yeah. i think you know that um i think you're going to bring that to a future schools forum meeting um because i'm yeah. sure there'll be lots of questions that uh, yeah. members would, would, would like to ask thank you yeah thank yeah you. yeah we'll make sure we get that on the forward plan as well okay. um, and and so the other the other area a uh, key issue for us as well is, is um i suppose um securing enough funding when a school partnership wishes to change um, its organisation, for instance. So where we've had whole scale change, I suppose more recently in Pontyland, the, amount, the level of investment that's needed to actually uh, make that change, there's no central government funding for that. Um, that wholly relies on, on, on the local authority um, to, to fund those changes. Um, and it's they're never small amounts of money. The change in Pontiel and cost the local authority over £57 million pounds in total. Um, so it is um, significant in, a significant amount of money. Um, so really to move on to probably some of the good news, that was a bit of the doom and gloom and, and, and where we've got the gaps and what we need to do. Um, but overall, you know, we are very lucky or personally I'm very lucky as the officer delivering this programme or responsible for delivering the programme um, that Northumberland um, County Council itself invests a significant amount of funding in all of its schools for the benefit of all of Northumberland children. So again, you can see in the report there that over the last, um, well, since October, October 2018 that we've invested over £101 million in delivering the school capital programme. 
Um, it also points out that we've done 69 projects delivered in 63 schools across the whole of Northumberland with projects ranging in value from 19,000 up to 43 million. So you can see it's a significant, a significant range. Um, and you can see again that there's the detailed programmes are contained within within the report, but I'll summarise each one um, so that you can understand the overall programme um, and who and which programme does which. So the school investment, uh, school capital investment programme, this is the programme of central government grant that we use to maintain our local authority maintained schools. Smaller projects like roof replacements, window replacements, boilers, all the things that keep our schools safe, watertight and open. Um, so again, since October 18, we've done 48 projects um, at the value of just over £3.8 million, pounds, um, predominantly over the last 21 months. Um, Insignificant challenges, shall we say, within the COVID um, pandemic. Um, there's been some real challenges on some of the projects over the last 18 months, two years, um, with increases in prices, as well as um, shortage of materials um, to make things happen. So it continues to be a very challenging market. Um, we also um, had some capital funding again that we bid for from central government for school nurseries um, and again we grew capacity at school two school based nurseries uh, with two projects that delivered um, to the value of 446,000 and Debbie will probably tell you a little bit about uh, one of those because uh, her school benefited from one of those uh, projects as well. Um, basic need again this is this is where we grow school capacity so a number of projects where we need to grow capacity so we've delivered seven projects again over the last 21 months to the value of about seven million pounds in there predominantly quite um, quite a lot of money spent at St Benabiscuit last summer um, due to reorganisation changes in Bedlington um, and the first time we'd used um, a system build that came on the back of a lorry uh, which caused quite um, a lot of entertainment for the for the, for the local community who had all got their deck chairs out on the footpath watching it being delivered and craned into site. So uh, during the, the, the pandemic, that was probably about as much entertainment as people were getting. Uh, but yeah, fantastic, fantastic project, something that they're really pleased with um, and was delivered um, actually on time. We did get the children in on time. Um, we also have funding from um, Section 106. So this is where we seek to developer contributions for education infrastructure. There is a whole new policy on that as well, and that's also going to um, scrutiny committee on the 7th of October and sets out how we calculate those contributions so that developers are fully aware of what the expectations of our education department are if they're going to come and build um, houses uh, within Northumberland. Putting you on the well, spot, Sue. Yeah. Sorry, putting you on the spot, are we likely to see more Section 106, 106 monies um, coming in? Yeah, yes, I mean, that, that there are a number of, of, of housing development applications in. I think we're currently standing about £11.7 million currently, Colin, Very that good. we've achieved through that. Obviously, that is promises at the moment. You know, yeah. Section 106 money is normally paid on a phase basis as, as, as the development is developed out. Um, okay. So we will make plans to spend that spend that funding um, as and when you know the right amount of houses are built and the impact of the of new children moving into the area is felt um, okay. but but we have delivered um, our first project using section 106 funding um, and we did that at Stannington first school um, again doing something quite flexible in terms of a, a mobile classroom that then can be moved um, to, to Chantry middle school when those children um, obviously that board of children moves through and we've got some of extra accommodation, again, delivering best value for the public purse in terms of being able to relocate the building as well. Um, as I've already mentioned, again, funded um, some of it by the local authority, but again, through basic need, was the age range change in Bedlington. Um, so again, we delivered three projects there. Um, obviously, Benabiscuit through the basic need, as I've already mentioned, but then two further projects for the last two schools, two first schools becoming primary. Um, in the Bedlington partnership and we spent just over 1.6 million pounds um, on that program. Um, I can't, I can't let that, sorry Sue, I can't let um, that go past without taking my opportunity to, uh, uh, as I have done before, to uh, express my frustration that uh, uh, the county is held responsible for 
making sure that there are the right number of places in the right uh, in the right locations. But you know, there are certain basic elements uh, which you don't have control over, um, yeah. such as a school unilaterally deciding to uh, to change its um, uh, its format. Yeah. But there you go. That's what That's you have right. to do. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. We have to react and, uh, and deal with whatever's thrown at us, gone in your right. And that is obviously when you're asking about surplus places, that also contributes to the growth in surplus places, yeah. um, giving us more capacity than we actually need in a partnership, but where we don't have, have, have that decision. But we'll probably have more of those discussions when I bring the school organisation plan. Okay. Okay, um, so, the, so the next um, area of, of, of significant growing demand is in our special school. Um, so in our special schools, um, so we do currently get some additional funding from the DfE um, in terms of growing capacity now. I think they've realised that there is that pressure nationally. Um, so I think we've just received another £850,000 as a local authority. But that mainly, you know, really doesn't scratch the surface with the number of places that we need uh, within our special schools with the growth between 7 and 9% on a year-on-year -year basis. So we can see, uh, again, using local authority funding um, and being as imaginative as we can with the basic need um, to deliver some of our additional places and capacity that we need in special schools. Um, so what we have done um, over the last, again, sort of 21 months is we've delivered five projects at the value of just over, over £3 million in our, in our special school estate to grow capacity. And I think we've, we've reported those previously, Ashdale um, and Hexham Priory, uh, smaller projects at um, Hillcrest Special School in, in, in at Cromlington. Um, and you'll be aware, I think we've discussed many times um, about our successful bid for a special free school um, in, in Northumberland um, that had got a target date of being open in September 2022. Um, but we're talking to the DfE currently about that being delayed. Um, again, I think the challenges they're, they're seeing um, in the construction market at the moment as well. So I think that's having, a, having an impact on, the, on that delay. But again, I think we'll, we'll, we'll come and talk um, a little bit more about our ideas and plans around how we're going to how we're going to address uh, that, that potential shortfall. Mm. Um, and then the, the the larger school builds that we've also done, um, we've obviously done two larger scale um, first route primary new builds um, within the last 21 months as well. So um, that was Dallas Hall Primary School and Morpeth First School. And we've spent £12.6 million on those two projects. Um, and I think something that we normally talk about on the agenda of Schools Forum uh, in the minutes was about Hayden Bridge. Um, and again, what we have done um, with our capital programme is support some investment in Hayden Bridge due to the, real, the, the reorganisation um, within the partnership. So again, we funded four projects there at the value of £5.2 million. Um, and we've also um, done work at the uh, Old Holt Whistle Middle School and um, converting that um, into a primary school and also again that's another £2.4 million pounds that the council spent um, on an academy building converting that as well. Um, and then last but not least, I suppose, oh sorry last but one, um, Pontyland School and Leisure Centre, you, you probably all heard me um, talk about that quite a lot. Um, but you'll be aware we um, we did open that late again due to the pandemic, but it did open um, in November, um, and that was a £43 million uh, building that brought together Pontyland High School, Pontyland Primary, um, and the new leisure centre and library. Um, and we also built a fire station as part of that project as well. Um, that, that, that was a first for the, for the education capital team to be building a fire station, but uh, yeah. Um, and then we've also got um, Hexham Academy's project scheme. Um, at the time of uh, obviously writing the, the report, we were um, on programme um, to get the first phase of the building complete for the autumn term um, 2021, so this September. Um, you may have seen in the, in the press, and I'm sure Graham will mention, um, that project was delivered um, around a week late again because of the, the pressures around, around, around the pandemic. Um, but it is um, something that is the first phase is now um, complete and looking absolutely fantastic and uh, we'll, we'll show you some of the images as we move through that and the second phase of that is due to be complete in April 2022 with the demolition and new parking and, and, and rugby pitch. So I think that's really just a bit of a whistle stop tour of, 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 of what my small but beautiful 
beautifully formed team have been doing in terms of capital uh, delivery. So uh, yeah, a really, really effective team that, that worked considerably hard um, to achieve the programmes that they're doing. I'm immensely proud of, of everything that, that, that we've all achieved together, that schools and, uh, and my team. So I'll just ask Bruce if that's okay, just to share a bit of a presentation, just to give you the, the highlights of some of the, the, some of, some of the projects. Um, so I'll just let him flick through uh, flick through the, sh the slides. I think there's there's annotations underneath each of them, so you'll be able to uh, to understand what's what. Is that all right, Bruce? You okay? Yes, of course. I'm just commencing that now. But I've commenced it on my without sharing it first, which was a cardinal error. Just bear with <laughs> can, Bruce, can we just um, cover the comments that have come in, the narrative comments? <clears throat> um, two from Alan Hardy. Uh, sorry, um, we've, we've dealt with uh, Alan's first point. The second one, it would be helpful to have some clear protocols for schools or trusts uh, which have been named as beneficiaries of Section 106 funding um, to know how and when they are able to access this. I mean, this is a very interesting point. Um, I think I know the answer, but can you or Sue comment on that? Yeah, I've responded to Fee and Allen briefly and I mean again it's something we're happy to discuss but essentially the developers contributions are received or will subsequently be received in the future solely on the basis of, de of delivering additional capacity mm. you know the principle behind the section 106 contributions are that the additional development creates additional pressure and requires additional school places so essentially, um, you know, again, it has to be very carefully attributed to that development of capacity as um, and, you know, again, there is many, many years between uh, getting a section 106 agreement in place and that subsequently coming to fruition yeah. in relation yeah. to any funding. Yeah. Um, again, yeah, if there are opportunities, sorry, Sue. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, so, so what, what we what we do is when um, a development is on the watch list, um, we do actually probably do some drive paths as well just to see how the housing numbers are going um, because section 106 will come in phases we don't wait you know it doesn't wait till the end and we get a big lump of say seven million pounds there will be stage payments throughout the section 106 so the way that it would work you know potentially on house number 50 we would get um, we would get a, a sum of money um, and normally that's a small amount of money probably about a quarter of a million pounds um, that we would use to to develop a business case and and see the number of places that we'd need and, and where we would need them. So it would be at that point that we would then contact the local schools that would be involved in that process. Up until that point, we really wouldn't be have anything at all to talk about. Um, you will be aware, and you know we we, we publish that within the school organisation plan. You know as to as, as to the areas that are going to need growth. Um, and, and we just keep in touch on an ad hoc basis with individual schools. Um, I'm thinking about um, Cramlington in the southwest sector, quite a large development. Um, and the driver behind that was, a, was an additional school, as well as some growth of one form entry in, in a local school. So we meet on an annual basis with the governing body there just to monitor progress, the impact on the numbers. Um, so when it's when it's a big development and it's getting close again, I think Three Rivers, we have regular discussions with, with, with Simon and Mark around, you know, the, the housing numbers and the impact that, that that's that, that that's going to feel um, and also seeing growth in the system and when it's going to hit different schools within the trust um, as well. So it's ongoing dialogue. Um, it isn't a protocol. I think it's it's a bit difficult, probably, because we're not quite sure how things, how the market's moving and what's going to happen, but more than happy to to you know, to, to put that in writing, um, that we would be in contact with schools six months ahead of, of any work needing to needing to happen. But a lot of things can change. And as, as Bruce has said, it has genuinely got to be growth. We do have to justify the funding. It's not just like get six million pounds. OK, well, the kids are not coming, but we'll have a new library instead. That yeah. really isn't the way that Section 106, it has got to be about physically growing capacity and putting extension on schools or building new schools. I but, think yeah. we can... It seems to me, Sue, that the key is that you stay uh, regularly in touch with schools who are potentially affected. And is a responsibility for schools to, uh, um, you know, uh, survey their own um, prospects and to yeah. make representations to you as well? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely teamwork, Colin. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, sorry, uh, just a, a, a yeah. further point. Um, Section 106 is not aimed purely at education, uh, is it, Sue? It's, it's a general infrastructure thing. That's right, and we, we all have to uh, jockey for position and put our case to be a, a really strong case, shall we say, okay. Colin? So Thanks. hence why I think we are the department in the council that's actually got a policy on it had it go through um, processes and get it approved by cabinet. So it, it holds more weight, shall we say, yeah. because of the processes that we've uh, that we've been through. Good, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Chair, there's another comment from Fee. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, All right. Sorry, Sue, can you see that? Oh. I, could, I couldn't actually, I'll just try and it's have a look because I'm just on the iPad yet. Can I help? Fears specifically raised the point, I'd responded before specifically around 106 and Fears raised the point about access to skip funding um, and I'm about access to skip funding where I'm sure it's a question of we, we, we probably have infinite demands and finite supply but I'm sure yes. we'll be happy to have that discussion with her. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um, the, way, the way that skip funding works is that we've got the data um, on each of our maintain schools. Um, that's an in, and then the, the buildings are independently surveyed, um, and each, um, I suppose, item is ranked and scored in terms of it, its its need. So it's as and when a project comes to the top of the list um, that you're contacted and things happen. If individual schools feel that something has deteriorated more um, and they've got a case that they're concerned about, you know, a leaky roof or something that we've got on our list to be done in two or three years time, but there's a, there's a major issue now. Again, we're more than happy to get a surveyor to come out and, and have a look at it, rescore it and reprioritise re it if that is felt that it's needed. So again, if you've got something specific, Faye, just drop us a line and uh, and we'll get back in touch with you. Schools also have access to their own smaller scale devolved yeah. formula capital funding as well. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right, Sue, do you want, shall I just briefly share this presentation? Yeah, yeah, that'd be lovely if you can just flick through it just so people can uh, see what we've done. Okay, yeah. Okay. Briefly again, breakdown of okay. I'll, I'll do that then, Bruce, if you like. Um, I can see. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, they, these, these are just a list of the, pro the kind of projects that we've done under um, Schools Capital Investment Programme. So, number of heating boilers, roofs, etc. That's it, Bruce. Thanks. Just to give you an idea that the little things are just as important as the big shiny things. Okay. Yeah, yeah thanks. And again, some of the some of the smaller things that we've done from from Skip, some physical pictures of things that have happened as well. So you can see Ashdale and roof works going on, Allendale Primary, and um, some nice new shiny boilers. Don't look very attractive, but uh, fundamentally in keeping a school open. Um, and again, some new roof works there as well. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, schools uh, capital fund there, so that's uh, Morpeth Road in Glyde. So they had an extension um, to provide an additional. Um, classroom for their for their two and three year olds capacity being built there for the 40 hours children and i think we should let debbie talk about this this is debbie's lovely outdoor um classroom that we went to see last week actually debbie is there anything that you want to say because it, it does look lovely <laughs> yeah it is it's amazing um we 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 put in for this as um opportunity that the funding came through from the DFE and um, Sue and a fabulous team helped to um, helped us to raise our aspirations over and above what we'd originally planned was a little tiny hut and um, when we kind of had the feedback of what was what was available we um, looked at it and it was effectively to support speech and language development it's a storytelling pod and it created in the side of our forest school right next to our early years team um, to be able to house and, and offer um, nursery places um, that and the storytelling opportunities, not just for our um, reception children, but for nursery as well. And not just during term time, we're kind of pairing up with the um, PVI provider. So it runs through holidays as well. But yeah. 
lovely. Sorry to put you on the spot, Debbie, but it was uh, well, it was lovely to see children in a building last week. It was, yeah, uh, well, we've only started, we may <laughs> start using it for the purpose it's intended because of COVID. We we couldn't indulge the funders with using it for the purpose it was intended because we were using it to split out our children um, and allow them to be um, spread out rather than having a large bubble we split smaller bubbles and used it for that purpose while covid was on so but it's amazing the acoustics in there are so much better than the main classroom and for listening and um developing all that um pre speaking listening skills it's been really good to have so thank you very much to the team for supporting our application for that we really appreciate the support we had okay thanks debbie okay bruce thanks and then Chantry Middle School, um, Colin, you might recognise this, the old music room that we converted into, into classrooms yeah. to deal with the uh, capacity growth um, at Chantry. So again, yes. it's been very well used. Yeah. Looks a bit better now than it did there, actually. It's a bit, a bit of an old photograph, isn't it? It's full of children and furniture now. Do you want to move on, Bruce? Um, and then again, uh, Whitrick Middle School, that was the first mobile that we put on there. Um, in terms of basic need um, and they've just had a second one um, delivered this summer as well as the children are, are, are moving up through the phases um, as well so you can see we've uh, grown some capacity there and we've also since as well extended um, looking at trialling some art provision um, at Astley so uh, they've got a third mobile classroom now as well so uh, quite a bit of a additional provision there at, uh, at Astley moving on. Thanks Bruce. Uh, Blythe Horton Grange, um, this was a, an extension again through basic need and this was the first time that we'd use modular construction. Um, so, so the white bit in the middle of the, the top photograph was um, all arrived um, on the back of a lorry and within a week uh, was, was put on site and, and ready to go. Um, and I must say the quality of the modular um, units that we've been getting now is absolutely first rate. Um, absolutely excellent um, quality finish as you can see from there so um, and we've continued to use that where the where the solution um, is appropriate really and you'll probably see we're, we're looking at um, doing a mobile classroom replacement program with some additional grant funding we got from central government um, so again we'll be looking to use some modular construction as part of the uh, as part of the program there so probably a future report coming through to schools forum that you can see what we've done there thanks Bruce um, and what we also did was build a traditional extension onto Blythe New Deliverable. Um, again, this was around um, a capacity growth because of house building in Blythe. Um, but again, we, we trialled the two projects together. Um, so we did the traditional um, extension at New Deliverable and the modular um, in terms of being able to do a comparison in terms of cost value for money. Um, and how quickly things were, were, were delivered as well. So that's uh, that was a, a real um, good project um, to do. Uh, Sue, have you drawn a conclusion from that? I think it's horses for courses, Colin. I think where you know that a site is constrained and time is limited, modular mm. is, is is very yeah. good. Yeah. What's happened at New Deliverable? It, it it was nice because it was quite a new building that you could build an extension that looked like it was part of the original building. So again, mm. I think it's uh, horses for courses, okay. um, but, but time and value for money is definitely modular, not traditional. OK, yeah. Thanks. Um, again, Stannington, I think we talked about this one as well, haven't we, that we've got that the, the standalone um, mobile classroom that will get picked up and moved, um, as well as phase one, which was a, which was more of a, a traditional build. But again, we took a second approach on the uh, on the second project. Thank you. Um, St Hilda's, this is um, obviously St Ben Biscop. This is again the modular construction that I talked about um, that came to, to site and was constructed within um, probably four weeks. There was some some more of the where the building joins, there's some brick slips to put in and toilets to connect to, to drains. But in effect, um, it's just quite amazing what, what actually can, can be achieved in such a short, short space of time, um, you know, through the pandemic as well. I mean, bearing in mind, we didn't actually place the order because of what was going on through the pandemic until the May. Um, and this building opened in the September and it's absolutely phenomenal what, what was achieved on that, on that yep. site. And the uh, head teacher there is really pleased with, uh, with what they've got. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. <clears throat> um, and again, um, next door at um, 
Bedlington West End. We also used the modular construction, but in a little bit of a different way. So we actually constructed a, a new hall, kitchen, and a couple of classrooms. That's so the first time we've done a large space in modular. Um, but again, has gone has, has, has been really uh, well received and really good for such a constrained site that meant the um, construction took place in a shorter period of time, which was very beneficial operationally to the school. And Chris, there's loads of slides. I'll have to not I'll have to not talk about everyone. Um, <laughs> Hillcrest again, just another yeah, just another extension there um, for our pupils with special educational needs. Um, so the first cohort of children were in last September and we've just had the second cohort in now as well. So that was a project that would grow expansion over two years. Yeah, Sue, if you could just sort of skip through. Yeah, speed up. If you just want yeah, to keep flicking through, so we'll not do any talking unless anybody's got any questions. I'll just, I'll just, just keep flicking. Okay. And. Collingwood, this is the SEN. Yeah. Job Ashley. Dinsloose Primary is another ARP, conversion of an existing space. Ashdale, conversion of a, an old miners institute originally, I think, um, into a special school, fantastic space. Our SEM free school, what it might look like, and there's the site, but it's not there yet. Doris all new primary, I think you might have seen some pictures of this before. Um, Morpeth First School just across the road from County Hall, looking looking lovely, really great construction there. Some construction with the builders on that one. Hayden Bridge, um, yeah, the, uh, the unit that we've done there in terms of their vocational centre that's also shared with adult um, services as well. Bit like extension at Ottergrown for their reorganisation. extension at Greenhoff for their reorganisation. Whistle, it looks a bit different to that now. We actually did the opening and the, the full event uh, on Friday, so lovely to see that building full of children. Fantastic quality there as well. Pontierland School and Leisure. Do you want to just click, click through these? Uh, these are yeah. um, pictures from the opening, um, some of the fantastic spaces that um, well. Kieran and Lynn leisure centre have got there so definitely worth a visit <laughs> if you get the opportunity we're all getting jealous yeah sorry <laughs> <laughs> no it's great that somebody gets it it's wonderful yeah 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 mm -hmm. um and then brown's project queen elizabeth so that's what it looked like before we started um we've just got some some oh sorry and there's some pictures that's the, the the courtyard area that they've got that we use some uh, some of the old bill, uh, bricks from the original wall garden so again a very different um construction because of being a grade two listed building so that uh, certainly brought some new challenges for us shall we say beautiful winter garden so you've seen some of the original features and i think bruce you'll have to flick onto some of the new things and then yep. some traditional yep. traditional uh blocks at the back but again the mature setting for the school oh, middle school classrooms as well as the ones in green is that it, is that it Bruce? yeah that's the mother's the last slide okay. sue that that is great thank you very much um I'll, something that just occurs to me is that um and go back to uh, debbie's comments it's uh, it's helpful to know what you can be ambitious for you know if if you think that you know um a temporary hut is <laughs> is all that's available maybe that's all that you ask for but it's just great to see what other things are available and uh, you know what we can uh, what we can aspire to um and so thank you very much i know that um i've said this several times before um, this is not within the purview of, um, of Schools Forum, which is essentially about uh, revenue funding, uh, but I'm sure we all appreciate having a, a periodic update about um, how capital funding is, is being used across the county. So thank you very much for, uh, for bringing that. Um, any further questions for Sue on that before we let her drive off from her car parking space? Yeah, I'm back to County Hall. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Colin. See you soon. Thank you. Okay. Um
Moving on then, um, item eight, uh, Bruce. Yes, national funding formula and school funding update. Again, I'll just share the paper on screen as we go quickly through this. Um, again, the story so far, if you like, in terms of background, um, I think we're all familiar with the concept of national funding formula by now. Um, current consultation we've discussed already this morning. Um, interesting, Colin picked up those comments about, you know, careful implementation and transition to avoid any unexpected disruption and the setting of no firm target date. So again, it's a question of uh, what that means in practice. And I think we're all waiting eagerly to really understand that. Uh, a reminder also that uh, at the in November meeting schools form last year, we agreed a two step approach towards the adoption of national funding formula figures. Uh, it meant essentially those values that were significantly either over, which were primary and key stage four or two, or under in terms of primary low prior attainment would have the gap closed in two equal steps, thereby sort of again uh, working in line with the principles for a smooth transition towards national funding formula and providing a degree of protection to those schools uh, well, who benefit from a higher or pool level currently. Um, so essentially we've set, you know, we set the strategy around this last year. I think essentially it's a question of can we deliver that? And I think the provisional figures indicate that hopefully we can. Um, new information released in July, provisional DSG figures, um, school funding overall increasing by 3.2% and 2.8% per pupil compared with 21 and 22. Um, again, minimum increases setting at 2% per pupil again, and that's a, a key reminder that all of this is, is pupil driven funding. Um, some success as well for us that the um, following the consultation around sparsity earlier on in the year, the amount of funding being uh, distributed through sparsity is increasing, is on doubling in 22-23. Uh, That's not to say that the individual schools allocations will double as more schools come within the pot, but nevertheless, that is encouraging from Northumberland's point of view. Um, overall increases, and again, nationally, and I've got a slide later, which just to show us what this could mean in terms of Northumberland provisionally. Um, and again, the important point to make is it's an 8% increase per head of population or relevant to the put to the 18 population in, uh, in case of high needs funding. However, we do have a, sm a falling sort of number of young people uh, and that does have implications in relation to that. Looking at the impact in terms of national funding formula values, there's 3% being added to those sort of basic levels uh, and um, some, some of the deprivation elements. However, there's only 2% increase applied to both the free school meals and the minimum per pupil funding increases. Um, that obviously is reflected in the table below and I think it's important for those schools who benefit from minimum per pupil funding to note that you know that will be the key factor and the likely increase per pupil is likely to be around two percent this year. Um, again high needs we've touched on. Um, central schools block uh, Central School Services block, again, there's an ongoing battle around this. We've seen the, his, the reduction to the historic commitment element before, but there's also a, a reduction to the ongoing responsibilities this year. Um, and again, that will result in a, a budget pressure to the council. We continue to engage with the ESFA in relation to the block and making representations in relation to this. Um, but again, that reflects some of the messages through the consultation as well, and why we're keen to you know, see this preserved. Um, but it's worth saying, um, and I do sympathise with the, the wider council budget, Bruce, uh, that doesn't impact on the DSG. Doesn't impact specifically on the schools block DSG, that's correct, yeah. Obviously, the central services to schools block is a is a far smaller element, but sits within the overall DSG per se. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, again, I'm not going to, I think this is the interesting one. I'm not going to go through on a line by line basis, but what this table coming from the SFA policy document outlines is the national funding formula value for 22-23 and how much funding is allocated nationally by reference to that, both in terms of, you know, millions of pounds and a percentage of the overall total. So again, that's interesting. Um, and again, what you see potentially for Northumberland is what that would mean in terms of our values if we close the gap around the national funding formula. Um, obviously has implications that key stage four up who would, ri would rise by less than the increase in the national value because historically we've been over and above that. Um, Again, we lifted free school meals last year to 570 on the basis of any additional funding in the formula, and that was always subject to affordability. Uh, we certainly wouldn't be increasing that. That's the element essentially we would need to look at in terms of balancing to our final figure, um, subject to the other demands within the DSG. But otherwise, again, we would see a significant increase in the low prior attainment figure from 840, which again saw a large increase last year, up to the national funding formula figure. Um, again, no proposals yet around the use of capping and scaling. We've used that in practice over the last uh, two to three years. But again, we need to see how in practice that will work and if or, and or if it's required for 22-23. Okay, again, Deadlines, key timetables, essentially 21st of January was the key deadline for the submission of the final APT to the ESFA. What it doesn't say in there, of course, is the fact that we probably receive the information from the DFE sometime in mid to late December. Um, but we're used to working with that timetable now. Um, if I may, just diving swiftly out of that, there is a figure there which again shows the provisional figures for Northumberland um, and again a lot of you know I always um, I'm hesitant using these in terms of treating them with a, a degree of caution but nevertheless in terms of the comparable elements with last year there is no growth element within this figure yet which accounted for £600,000 last year we're seeing roughly a 2.9% increase in the schools block 7.57% increase in the high needs block of just over three million pounds. That's below the 8% funding floor they referred to in the paper, simply because it's 8% per head of school population. Because out we've seen a, a small fall in our school population, that figure is correspondingly under the 8%. Uh, and again, the implications for the central services school block as well, as per the paper. A uh, reminder as well, the fourth element of this in terms of the early years block is not yet available. Uh, and we'll get that through again in November. Um, again, we talked earlier about the discussions at Funding Formula Committee. We have set our strategy around the direction of travel. We will, um, you know, model on this basis, taking into any consideration, any implications around pupil movement, uh, et cetera, for next year. But essentially, we've we've largely set the direction of travel when we agreed the two-stage strategy last year. But I'm happy to take any comments or questions so far. The next stage of this will be, we will examine in more detail proposals at Funding Formula Committee on the 3rd of November, and then bring back final consultation proposals to the schools forum on the 17th of November. There will then be a period of consultation with the school through November and December. We will then again get our final figures in mid to late December, uh, at which point a report will be drafted both to cabinet and to schools forum for January. Okay. It's a well-trodden path, uh, Bruce. Okay. Again, I'm just going to come out of the paper, the um, 
you know, that paper is all in the pack. Just happy to take any questions. If there are any. Any questions for Bruce? Oh, clear. We are certainly continuing our agreed strategy. Um, and the detail will be discussed at our November meeting. Um, but at formula funding um, before that, um, <laughs> I'm inclined, Bruce, to say that you know our, our uh, formula funding meeting in September. We invited basically anybody who wanted to come from Schools Forum. I'm inclined to uh, to make that same offer again for um, uh, for for the next formula funding meeting. Well, again, that's that's um, Wednesday, the third of November, commencing at nine thirty. If members want to make a note of that in terms of their diaries, and if we can include everyone in the uh, in the papers and the invitation. We will, yeah. Okay, Bruce, thank you um, for that huge amount of work uh, for you and the finance team, and that is much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Okay, moving forward then to um, item nine. Okay, final item work program, updated date, meeting dates, and work program for uh, 21 22 academic year. Um, Bear with me. Again, dates are in your pack. Uh, the next meeting, 17th of November. Yeah. The um, with all of the work going on at the moment, we've agreed the cancellation of high needs committee on the 6th of October, but we have a further meeting in on Wednesday, the 1st of December, when we can look at the subsequent high needs budget and figures in more detail. We have the funding formula committee in for 3rd of November, and those, you know. We obviously we have the dates now for the rest of the year, as in the paper, with a you know outline work program to be additional items to be added as required. Okay, any comments on that? Sorry, I'll share that. Thank you. Um, then that completes the agenda. Other than um, any other business, I have none. Any other urgent items anyone needs to um, to raise? Date of next meeting are scheduled, and that's the end of the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Thank you, Bruce. Oh. Okay. Thanks, Chair. See you all again soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks, bye.